essentially the stomach, if you will, because that's where the raw materials come and then eventually uh, you get the final product. And it is uh, one of the most hazardous part of the, uh, of, of the plant, especially when the reactions which are being carried out are highly exothermic. So many reactions in pharmaceutical industry, petrochemical sector, polymerization reactions are highly exothermic. And many of the accidents that you hear or read about in newspapers are suddenly, you know, reactors blowing up. They have to do with essentially runaway. And they are one of the most persistent problems in the chemical industry. And awareness is fairly low about how to manage those hazards. Okay. Other process hazards, uh, they are, are relatively simpler to manage. Well, quote unquote simpler because there is process safety management you know, aspects to it and there are many procedures, uh, you know, standards, design that is all followed. Even in chemical reactions, you have a lot of uh, you know, emphasis on how to design the reactor and how to actually integrate the safety systems along with the reactor to prevent a runaway. So, uh, uh, Professor Navar, uh, as you, as I've told you, he specializes in this area. Uh, and so he will, in an you know, try and summarize for us, you know, what are the key issues in managing chemical reaction hazards. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you have to be attentive because you will have to conduct a test on his material as well after he shares the material. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Roy. And you know, luckily you have a small class, so uh, interrupt me uh, at any point. Is there anyone here who took CL 678 last year? Yeah, some, how many of you? Okay, so some of the material is familiar, but I think it's complex enough that you won't get bored and uh, it's always good to revise it, right? So, um, we are going to look at reactive chemical hazards. So, I took the first lecture, um, you know, a while uh, ago. So, maybe if you have forgotten, you know, I'll do, I'll do some, uh, there's some overlap and I'll remind, I'll connect with the first lecture I took. So that was the ground reality, right? So number two was what I did uh, earlier. So, so we'll focus on reactive chemical hazards. What are the screening methods? Uh, so screening means how do you know whether, uh, you know, you always need to prioritize. So screening is talking about, is this really a big hazard or uh, uh, is this a reaction that it's not likely to create any major problems? So where do you have to focus your attention on, right? So that's screening method. And by screening methods, we are talking also about what are the experimental methods. If you have a reaction, how do you know whether it's hazardous or not? And then there is Tossel's criteria. So this is more like a heuristic which was developed with a lot of thought. Uh, and there is an excellent textbook by Tossel on it. And I'll give you the reference if somebody wants to read more into it, right? So that's what we are going to look at today. So let me start with this. We saw the last time, right? Explosion at Andhra Pradesh Pharma factory. I mean, this was a little different, but uh, you, know, you, you see photos of explosions all the time. And uh, I just show you some photos just to start with, you know, there was another explosion, uh, you know, people die. We are going to look today at this question. Let's keep it simple. Why do vessels explode? And I'm using vessels because you could call it reactors, right? It's a reactive chemical hazard, but reactions don't always happen where you want them to happen. So for example, you may have a storage tank and you're storing some chemical in it. You don't want it to react. You just want it to stay there. Now, it doesn't really listen to you. Under the right set of conditions, the reaction starts and there you have a reactive chemical hazard. In fact, those can be the most dangerous ones because you're not expecting, right? In a reactor, you're vigilant. You're watching your temperatures. You, know, you have your measures. If it's a storage tank, it's somewhere out in a tank farm. You rarely visit it. And there's no, maybe somebody's taking readings. That's all. So when reactions happen at places where you're not expecting to happen them to happen, that can also be a re reactive hazard. And in fact, that can be a peculiarly problematic hazard. So, for example, at the left, I show you some typical reactors and yeah, on the slide here, I show you some reactors, right? And these reactors uh, are typically where you would expect a reactive hazard. A majority of our discussion is going to be centered around reactors, but on the right, I also have distillation column. And there have been uh, accidents where um, distillation columns have exploded because there was a runaway reaction that people were not really uh, expecting. Uh, and it happened uh, in the wrong sort of situation. So it's not just reactors that you have to be careful about. Storage tanks, hmm? another place where reactive hazards, if you look at the LG accident that happened a while ago in Wizard, this was related to a reactive hazard in the storage tank, right? So this is what 
this is the broad area that we are going to cover today. Now, let me start with a pretty simple question. Uh, how much, so you have water, right? You have water, say, in this bottle. Now, suppose I start heating this up, you know, temperature rises from 30 to, say, 100 degrees. Finally, it evaporates, starts making steam, right? Maybe the bottle is open. How much more volume do you think, take a guess, the steam occupy than water, right? The, what is the invariant is the quantity. So, suppose I take 1 kilo of water and heat it up. Right, 1 kilo of water, how much volume does it occupy? You know the density, you know, 1000, 1 gram per cc, you know what volume it occupies. So, suppose I start with 1 gram of water, now that occupies 1 cubic centimeter. If it turns into steam, take a guess, how much volume does it occupy? Twice, 10 times, 100 times, okay, good guess. What, are, any other guesses? Huh? Will depend sort of on the temperatures, etc. But if you look at the density and you can calculate the density of steam either using a steam table and I'm, I'm, no, I just did a quick calculation, so just verify it. But typically the ratio is going to be somewhere around 1500, 1700. Huh? And this is one of the fundamental problems that gases occupy or vapors occupy a hugely larger volume than the liquid from which they are formed. If you start with a solid, again it's roughly the same. Remember, the density of a vapor is very different, 0.6 kg per meter cube. If you have water, say 1000 kg per meter cube, if you have some solid, maybe 2000, 3000, 4000, you know, steel, 7000. So, solids are roughly similar. The transition from a solid to a liquid, you know, melts something. The volume doesn't change too much. You melted a lot of things in a pot in the, on the gas. The moment you have a transition to the vapor, volume expands like crazy. And this is the problem. Hmm? So, take, so what happens, suppose it's an open vessel, fine, I boil water, no problem. But suppose I had a bottle which was closed and I started heating it. Now, this water wants to expand, right? It wants to expand. So, what's going to happen if the volume is fixed, pressure is going to rise. This is the cause of, and it's a very fundamental thing, but I think you have to keep it at the back of your mind. And I wanted to just, so I, mean, I tried making this yesterday, I don't know if I got the number of squares right. But if you start with the blue square, right, imagine that much water is there. And now you heat it up. The amount of steam occupied under similar conditions is going to be that much. Huh? That expresses, I mean, 1600 is a big factor, or 1500, or 1000, whichever, depends on what conditions you are working at. Huh? In any case, it's a big factor, and that's what we have to be cognizant of. Now, uh, very often you see tank farm fires like this, and uh, so I'm going to switch between the fundamentals and uh, uh, what's happening on the practical side. So, so if you have a fire. Uh, and you, your vessel is unaffected by the fire. There's an external fire, but your reactor just happens to be in the vicinity. Or you have a tanker, a uh, road tanker, which is just standing next to the fire which happened because of unrelated factors. And the tanker need not even contain a flammable substance. It may have just water in it or milk in it. What's going to be happening is sooner or later, because of the fire, the temperature inside rises, the liquid wants to boil. If it boils, hmm, now, two things could happen. Let me just go ahead. If it's an atmospheric tank, hmm, mostly the vapors are going to come out, assuming you have designed it correctly, right? So, that's the, that's, the, that's the importance of chemical engineering design. So, what you see there on the left is called a goose neck. And just an open opening. You'll see at the top of a lot of water tanks, a lot of storage tanks, you'll see a goose neck or something similar. So, that's required to keep the tank atmospheric, right? Because the pressure increases, whatever is happening is going to come out. And the tank will always stay equilibrated. Huh? In principle, doesn't always happen. We'll look at that. This is for a atmospheric tank. Hmm? So if you heat this tank from outside, suppose there's a fire and you are even keeping water inside it. Unless there was a gooseneck, what would happen? The volume would expand. It can't go anywhere. Pressure would rise. Ultimately, every tank has a design pressure. It's going to burst. Hmm? So that's what's going to happen uh, for a uh, atmospheric tank which gets heated. If it's a pressure vessel, hmm, you've seen this device, what is this one? You recognize this? Is this a control valve? What is this device? You see it at the top of reactors, pressure vessels, distillation columns, uh, force on wheels. You remember what device this is? Sorry? Pressure relief valve, PRV. This is a PRV and this one? Rupture disc, right? So this is a PRV or a rupture disc. So similarly, if I didn't have an atmospheric tank, uh, any tank without a vent, you have to sort of assume it's a pressure vessel, right? Because unless it's vented, if something happens in it, so if you, if you ever design an atmospheric tank, always provide a vent. And always provide a vent, you shouldn't put a valve or something in it because otherwise somebody will accidentally close it and you'll have a problem. So either a vessel is atmospheric, in which case it should freely vent. 
if it's not atmospheric it's a pressure vessel and then you'll have a device of this nature right so if it works correctly as temperature rises volume expands the extra gases will be released and hopefully you won't have a explosion at least you may still have a fire but you won't have an explosion in the scheme of things fire is typically less bad than an explosion or less bad you don't want a fire but you would rather things burn than they explode explosions are really nasty hmm? now I just skipped this slide. I'm trying to connect this to what we did the last time. Remember, we had these four quadrants, and Professor Roy has already, you know, probably talked a lot about it. Likelihood, which is probability, and the impact. Hmm? So, if you have a fire extinguisher or something like that, it could be pretty frequent, high likelihood, but the impact may be moderate or low. Uh, if you have somebody bumping his head, somebody having a fracture, those are other quadrants. What we are talking about today is high impact but low likelihood, right? Luckily for us, explosions don't happen everywhere. Uh, you may have a plant running well for 10 years and then it explodes. But when it explodes, it goes bankrupt, shuts down for 6 months, many people die. Those are the events that we are looking at today and very peculiar to the chemical industry. It's very peculiar to reactive hazards. And they don't always happen. See, if a reactor always explodes, it will explode in the lab scale and you will never do that reaction under those conditions. The challenge is when things go right, most of the time you are happy in the lab, you are happy at pilot, for many days you ran a 1000 litre reactor, then you scaled it up to 10 reactors and then one day something goes wrong. Ah, and we have to see what is it that goes wrong and we will be looking at that today. Any questions? Let's keep it interactive, something is not clear, let me know. Right, so reactive chemical hazards, but before we go to reactive, so far what we did was non-reactive, right? So remember, reactive are not the only class of hazards. If you just have a fire, there's no reaction. It's just heating things up. Things can still explode. Mm? So there are non-reactive ways of making things explode. And first we have to understand those which you've done so far. And now we'll come to the reactive side. A bit of a detour, but if you have an exothermic batch reaction, mm, that's what we're going to talk about today. This framework, what I'll deal with can be the same thinking extend itself to continuous reactions. But I'll try to focus on exothermic batch reaction. Mm? That is the... Uh, category where we start. So first, how do you cool, uh, if you want to keep a batch reactor isothermal, uh, what are your ways out? How do you cool it? One, you could put an external jacket. In this case, it's called a limpet coil. Uh, you pass cooling water through it. That's what's shown on the left. This is the coil. You'll pass cooling water, chilled brine, whatever it is. Uh, reactions happening inside. Heat is liberated. Heat is moving from inside to outside. It's taken away. Uh, that's a typical way to cool it. There are other ways, but let's talk about these two. Second, you could put a coil inside, same principle. Huh? What, is the, what is the cooling? Is it latent or specific in this case? In the, in the utility side, suppose I have cooling water. Huh? Is the cooling due to latent heat or specific? Specific, right? It's specific and not latent because typically your, your cooling water will come at 30 degrees, will leave at 40 degrees. So there is a MCP delta T that is responsible for cooling. Now, if I am carrying out an exothermic reaction in say methanol at 50 degrees, and my cooling fails, huh? what do you think will happen? Just there is some reaction, methanol is the solvent and cooling fails. Huh? It's an exothermic reaction. So cooling fails, so heat is, but reaction is still happening. So heat is generated, it's not going out. So what would happen? Temperature will increase. Hmm? But suppose it is 50 degrees, temperature goes 60, 80, 100, 120, it's a steel reactor. Do you think steel melts at 120? No. What's, what's, what's the melting point of steel? Very high, about 1000 degrees. Right? So let's say in this case that's not a challenge. So why do we worry? What's the challenge? Why are we worried about an exothermic reaction where the cooling fails? Uh, this is a point. Sorry? Yeah, take a guess. Catalyst? Uh, what do you mean by catalyst? Suppose this is a non-catalytic reaction. There's no catalyst involved. Hmm? Cooling fails. Now what's the problem? Any thoughts? It will affect the rate of the reaction. Very good. But suppose I'm talking not of the product quality. I'm talking of safety. Why do we worry? If I'm a safety, if I'm looking at process safety and temperature shoots up, what's my problem? Hmm? It's quite fundamental. Take, yeah, any thought? Vapors form, right? So vapors form, if it boils, you'll have the still 1600 times increase and you have to take care of those vapors. Alternatively, look at vapor pressure, right? Every temperature will have for pure methanol a corresponding pressure. Every reactor will be designed for a certain pressure. So suppose you look at this diagram and methanol boils at 60, 64, so at that point the vapor pressure in absolute term should be 760, right? So maybe you have designed the reactor for 2 bar, but at some point, suppose you reach 100, 120, the pressure is going to exceed 2 bar, it's going to become 3 bar, 4 bar, 
So it's not the melting hazard. The temperature itself is usually not a problem. In some cases it can be because strength varies and things like that. Usually the problem is pressure rises and the pressure will exceed the design capacity of your reactor. Hmm? This and if it exceeds what would happen? It will explode. Ah, of course there are backup systems, uh, PRVs, RDs but if they were not there it would explode at some point. You will have a factor of safety if you go beyond that design pressure your reactor will explode. This is what you don't want. Uh, one thing remember the y axis on this graph is a log scale. Right? So sometimes it gives you a, a false sense of comfort, really the vapor pressure rises exponentially. So as temperature rises, the pressure really, really shoots up very, very fast. Huh? So that's why temperature is your enemy and I think on the previous slide I give you a thumb rule, you know, vapor pressure doubles for every 20. It's a thumb rule, it's a heuristic. You can actually do a calculation and it will vary for every thumb. Hmm? Now and remember uh, reaction rate also rises but that's a different story, we'll, we'll come to that in a bit. So this is one problem, every vessel and I say cylindrical but every vessel has a maximum pressure rating. Have all of you done your equipment design courses? So you know that you know there is a design pressure and things like that and the, uh, you know vessels are going to explode. Now comes our second problem. The second problem is rate constants for every reaction. Hmm? They change with temperature. The rate constant of a reaction, uh, let's say it's an exothermic reaction, will the rate constant increase or decrease with temperature? Rate constant of a reaction typically will and what's if it's endothermic? Now that's a trick question. See the equilibrium constants have a different dependence but for rate constants irrespective of whether it's endo or exothermic, the rate constant will increase with temperature. Huh? Clear? Reactions happen faster at higher temperatures. Now, very often you're confused because if you use Le Chatelier's and Thermo, that's the equilibrium constant but not for the rate constant. The rate constants are increasing. So typically, you know, heuristic is every 10 degree rise, the reaction rate is going to double. Hmm? The second point and the third bullet points, what is the activation energy? Hmm? You know why it's, uh, so suppose the activation energy was zero, what would happen in this equation? Rate would not change, right? E raised to zero is one and rate would not change, rate constants would not change with temperature. So more the activation energy, the faster the rate increases with temperature. Hmm? More the activation energy, the rate increases faster with temperature, it's a crucial point. And where do you think the rate, uh, the activation energy is higher, synthesis or decomposition? Uh, typically for decomposition. And this point will be relevant later, but just keep it in mind. Uh, this is the activation energy. So you need to go above that hump, but the value determines how fast your constant changes with temperature. Hmm, clear? Any questions? No? Okay. Now this is a concept of a thermal runaway. Uh, it's a crucial concept. It's only relevant for exothermic reactions in general. Why? Because in an exothermic reaction, heat is liberated. So when heat is liberated, what happens to the reaction temperature? Rises. Huh? Suppose, I forget the isothermal case, but suppose your cooling is not great. Suppose you're not doing, you're doing a bit of cooling, but not all that cooling. Or even imagine an adiabatic case, right? Where the whole reactants are trapped in a vessel. So when you do that, as the exotherm proceeds, the temperature rises. Huh? As temperature rises, what happens to reaction rate? Rises again. So as reaction rate rises per unit time, what happens to the heat liberated? Rises. That causes the rate to rise even more. Ah, so you have a self-accelerating phenomena here or you have a case of positive feedback which is very crucial. It doesn't happen in the case of uh, endothermic reaction. Ah, it wouldn't. So it only happens in the case of these exothermic reactions. As a reaction proceeds, it gives more heat which raises rates, which gives even more heat. So in principle, if there were no constraints, you know, it will go up to infinity because it, the cycle will continue. Uh, that's the, of course, there is a bit of heat escape, which slows it down, there are other things that happen. But this is the concept of a thermal runaway. Why is there a runaway reaction? You call it a runaway because at room temperature, you have a fixed rate. But at high temperatures, your rate may not be under your control. Yeah, you have a question? No, no questions? Sorry. Uh, so this is a thermal runaway. Now we go into a bit of the equations. So if, if you have a heat balance, right, and you look at, uh, you look at on the left side, this is the heat. It's always an exothermic reaction we are looking at. What is the total heat produced? You have a certain reaction rate. You have the volume of the reactor that you are carrying it out. And you have the heat of reaction. Uh, three independent, three different parameters. 
Now the rate itself, let's assume it's a first order reaction, then this is the free exponential, right? This is the activation energy Z, this is the free exponential factor. And now you've done your reaction kinetics and CRE, so you recognize this. Huh? Concentration times the progress, one minus the conversion, right? And this could be N, but typically for the case of today's analysis, we'll look at first order reaction. Hmm? Because they are easy to study and you know the constant remain easy and things like that. Now you just take this R and substitute it in the first expression hmm? and you get this expression. And this expression we'll study a bit because this the heart of everything you're doing lies here. Remember two things, the heat release rate is exponential function of temperature. Where do you see this here? Say QRX. Let's imagine delta H. See, delta H would also vary, but let's imagine it's a constant. So Q is a volume of the reactor is constant, not changing. So Q is a function of the rate of the reaction. The rate of a reaction is an exponential function of temperature, not a linear function. And hence the heat release is an exponential function of temperature and in the increasing sense. Huh? Heat is not reducing, it's increasing as temperature rises. Second, it's proportional to volume, which is length cubed, right? If you take a cylinder, okay, pi r square, so the pi r square h, so r, r and h are the length terms, right? So it's cubical in the sense of length. What about the heat removal? Remember the sketches I had, you know, this is how you remove heat. Suppose you had a jacket or a coil outside, and if you have to do a rough analysis, order of magnitude, the heat removal from a reactor will be proportional to what, what exponent of length? We just said that the heat generation is proportional to length cube because it's volume terms. Now for a sphere, it would be, for anything, any shape, it would be length raised to 3. What about the heat removal? Suppose you wanted to model the heat removal from this reactor, go back to your heat transfer. What kind of equation is, what the fundamental rating equation for heat transfer? How do you calculate areas of a heat exchanger or a... What is the equation, sorry? Q A L M T D, right? Q, Q is equal to U A L M T D, heat transfer coefficient. So let's keep that a constant. Let's keep L M T D a constant. What A are we talking about? Okay. Surface area, excellent. So surface area in this case would be proportional to what exponent of length? Square. But this is a parameter which is important that, look here, I said that heat release is proportional to L cubed but heat removal will be proportional to L squared, which puts you at a disadvantage when the reactor becomes larger. Hmm? If I double a reactor, the volume changes as L raised to 3, but the surface area still increases, but increases as L squared. Which is the tortoise and which is the hare? The, the rabbit is the volume. The volume will race ahead and the surface area will not keep pace. So a reaction which works at small scale, exothermic reaction, may not work so well at a larger scale. Uh, fundamentals. Hmm, any questions? Okay, let's, so this is the production term. Now, uh, it's a bit complex. We'll not go into the, we don't have enough time to go into the numbers. But let's look at that R, the rate term. Uh, we, have, we have said that the delta H is constant. So the rate term has two parts. This is just from the previous slide. Remember, we are talking about the rate term here. And these are the two parts and we are trying to analyze how the first part is different from the second part. So, as a reaction proceeds, huh? now, now I am not saying as temperature rises, I am saying as a batch reaction proceeds. Suppose you have an A plus B reaction, you dumped both A and B together and now the reaction is taking ahead. Huh? Suppose it is an exothermic reaction under adiabatic conditions, no heat removal. What happens to temperature? Now before we come to the equation also, what happens to temperature? Batch reaction, A plus B, exothermic, adiabatic. As it proceeds, what happens to temperature? Increases, has to increase. As temperature increases, let's keep E and R constants. What happens to this first term? You know, the entire, K0 is also a constant. What happens? Increases. Mm -hmm. That's the upward arrow. What happens to the second term? Let's imagine it's a first order reaction. The second term, the XA is the conversion. So as this goes up, the bracket reduces. Now this is counterintuitive. As a reaction proceeds, initially you have a lot of concentration. So the rates are high. But as it proceeds, the rate may come down. Now because you don't have enough concentrations in the solvent left for things to react. So these parameters are actually going against each other. Hmm? However, the first one is exponential and typically it wins till a certain point because the second one is only a linear parameter. But again, it's very difficult to give you a qualitative answer you have to write a MATLAB model or put it in Excel and figure out what happens. 
Uh, but what this tells you is as a reaction proceeds, there's a bit of complex things happening. But in general, the temperature is increasing and then it stabilizes when the second parameter sort of catches up. How do you see it in practice? Now, this is the concept of a thermal explosion or a reaction runaway. So, let's let's see what we are doing here. X axis is the time for which a reaction is running. Now, you can do this model in MATLAB and I would encourage you to do it. It takes some time. Use some activation energy. In this case, it's been generated by, and this is all from the book by Stossel, most of it. And so, 100 kilojoules per mole. And uh, you model some heat release rate, which is basically tied to your delta H. Hmm? What we are trying to do is see how the progress, so the temperature rises in any case, because it's an exothermic. We, we are not seeing any reaction where the temperature is falling. That would not happen. The temperature is rising. However, we are taking different cases where now I'm introducing a new term, delta T AD. Anybody remembers what this term is? Maybe you have seen it in thermo. Sorry? Exactly, adiabatic temperature rise. Now, what does that mean? You take any reaction, carry it out under adiabatic conditions. If all the heat released is not removed at all, it goes into the reactants, into heating things up. So, MCP delta T. What would be the maximum temperature? If I take a reaction, I insulate this bottle, carry out the reaction in this. Imagine this is a calorimeter and I keep a thermometer in there. At the end, what would be the maximum temperature? Hmm? So, if a reaction is highly exothermic, do you think delta T AD will be high or low? Highly exothermic reactions will have a high delta T, right? So, delta T AD of 400 Kelvin means it's a very exothermic reaction. If your delta T AD is small, it's not a highly exothermic reaction, right? So, you can model this, but what happens is depending on what your delta T AD is, the temperature always rises. There is a sudden kickoff. Now, this phenomena is very interesting. There is a sudden kickoff because of the exponential nature of things. And after that, what has happened is most of your reagents have been consumed. Hmm? So, the temperature may be high, but at that time, there is no reaction happening. So, it just stays there. If it was an isothermal reactor, it would cool down again. But it is adiabatic. It stays there. Nothing else it can do, right? But why is the reaction not happening? The temperature is high, but the second term has reduced. So, you do not have any reagents. They have all been consumed. And this is, this is what happens in a thermal explosion. What you worry about is this phase, because see what's happening in this phase, you're going from say 100 degrees, suddenly the operator will not have much time to react, you're suddenly going to 500 degrees. You won't have much time to react, uh, your, your fire extinguishers, your cooling system, there's nothing much you can do. You can do stuff in the initial stages, but once the runaway starts, it's very difficult to stop a reaction. And most people, we think in terms of linear changes. Polynomial or exponential changes are very difficult for us to deal with. So, as an operator, you'll be seeing, okay, last five hours, temperature changed by five degrees, 10 degrees, he's happy. Suddenly, at this point, forget hours, in a matter of minutes, the temperature will have shot up a very large amount. Now, that's what's difficult to deal with. And this is what we don't want. This is what we are trying to avoid. The whole idea behind today's lecture is to identify, if you go to a plant and you have hundreds of reactions in pharma, which is my reactor where delta T AD is 400 and we are very operating very close to this point. That if you know, and that's the beauty or the danger of safety, that all reactors will look the same. See, till this point, they all look about the same. You have no clue which is a dangerous reaction. But once they shoot off, things change very drastically. And that is the beauty of Stossel that he has developed these criteria uh, in order to screen this. So, what happens if cooling fails? It behaves adi adiabatically. What happens if agitation fails? Remember, most of these are large reactors. They have an agitator. What happens? How will a reactor behave huh? if agitation fails? Isothermally, or how will it behave? Suppose cooling doesn't fail. Cooling water is still there, but agitation has failed. Still adiabatically. Because these are large reactors. Remember, there's not a lot of loss of heat by conduction alone. You'll have to have force convection in them in order to keep them at the same temperature. Point is, if any failure happens, the scenarios we are worried about often arise because some cooling fails. Now, we will see some case studies because the electricity was lost and the agitator stopped. Whenever any of these happen, the reactors behave as if they are adiabatic. So, the adiabatic conditions is sort of the worst thing for an exothermic reaction. You are generating all the heat, but you are not removing anything. Else. And that's what we study. If you can control an adiabatic situation, you can control pretty much any other situation. Hmm? Very few of these reactions run truly isothermally. If you look at batch reactions, they'll be try to keep it close to isothermal. So you'll heat it up to 80 degrees, reaction stops, then you apply cooling. Huh? So you're not running it adiabatically, it would go up to say 400 degrees. But you are letting it rise to say 120, 150 and then it comes down, right? You could run it isothermally. Challenge is you'll take a huge amount of cooling and it's not very practical. So many of these do not run isothermally. Now we'll go into a case study. This is one of the... Uh, 
CSB, Chemical Safety Board case studies, right? And we'll use it also for my last lecture. But let's look at it, and I think it's quite interesting to see it. Like, hope it plays. <laughs> On December 19, 2007, a powerful explosion and fire occurred at T2 Laboratories, a small chemical producer in Jacksonville, Florida. The blast killed and injured workers, destroyed T2 Laboratories, and extensively damaged four nearby businesses. Windows blew into offices, striking workers with flying glass. The explosion at T2 Laboratories is one of several accidents that the CSB has investigated caused by runaway chemical reactions. Accidents resulting from reactive hazards occur too frequently and often have serious consequences. Behind me on this concrete pad, there used to stand a structure some 50 feet high that had a reactor vessel in it, in which the company that operated here, T2 Laboratories Incorporated, manufactured a chemical known as methylcyclopentadienyl manganese tricarbonyl, or MCMT for short. The entire structure and reactor vessel were blown away in the explosion. T2 produced MCMT, a gasoline additive, in batches using a 2,500-gallon reactor. An operator controlled the process with a computerized system in a nearby control room. In the first step, liquid chemicals and sodium metal were loaded into the reactor, heated, and then mixed with an agitator. The reaction produced hydrogen, which was vented to the atmosphere. In normal operations, when the temperature reached 300 degrees Fahrenheit, the operator would turn off the heating system. But because this reaction was exothermic, or heat producing, the temperature inside the reactor would continue to rise. At 360 degrees, operators would begin to periodically fill the reactor's cooling jacket with water. As the water boiled, heat was removed, controlling the temperature. However, on the day of the accident, the CSB found that the operator tried to cool the reactor as usual, but the cooling system likely malfunctioned, perhaps due to a blockage in the water supply piping or a valve failure. The temperature and pressure inside the reactor began to rise uncontrollably in a runaway chemical reaction. T2's co-owners returned to the plant after a worker called to report the cooling problem. While one owner searched for the plant mechanic, the other went to the control room. Concerned about a possible fire, he warned employees to move away from the reactor. Inside the reactor, the pressure was still increasing, reaching 400 pounds per square inch and bursting the rupture disc. Witnesses heard a sound like a jet engine as high pressure gas began to vent from the reactor. But it was too late. Within 10 seconds, there was a massive explosion, equivalent to about 1,400 pounds of TNT. The blast damaged buildings over 1,500 feet away. Debris rocketed up to a mile. The co-owner and the operator in the control room were killed. Two operators further away died from flying debris. 32 other people were injured, including 28 at nearby businesses. This facility uh, housed multiple types of chemicals that was a... Okay, hmm? so we'll, we'll again look at this video in the light, but so this is the kind of situation that we are trying to avoid, right? These are called... Uh, runaway reactions and you can see how how nasty they are and uh, if you look visit a lot of indian plants the, and not all explosions of course there may be solvent leaks there may be other things that happen but runaway reactions are a particularly difficult type of situation and hence i think what we want to do is sensitize you to how do you identify you know how how close are you what are the precautionary measures and things like that
uh, we could play the whole video, but one of the things I want to highlight from later in the video is the owners, uh, there was a chemist and a chemical engineer and they had done this reaction at a one liter scale from which they directly scaled it up all the way high. So one of the things is scale up. At one liter, there was no problem. When they scaled it up, this happened. And even at scale up, they ran for a very long time at half reactor capacity. But then there's always a temptation to increase, right? So they said, let's increase the batch size by one third. Huh? These are the preludes to the incident. And then at some point, this happens. So scale up is the other thing which comes up later in the video. But you can, you know, watch the video later. Uh, let's move on. So couple of things so on the on this slide, right? What you see is the first column is vessel volume. Huh? As you go up, you go from a 2.5, so 2.5 meter cube is 2,500 liters. And all the way up to say the first part, right? And then you have smaller things. So let's look at the first four rows because those are increasing reactor size. Look at the heat loss. Huh? This means if you don't have a insulated reactor, if you just have a metal reactor, what is the rate at which heat is going to be lost? Hmm? Does it increase or decrease? With size, the heat loss decreases because your volume goes up, but your surface area has not gone up. Huh? So, which is why sometimes in a in a small uh, flask, a reaction will cool down rather fast. If you keep it in a 25 meter cube reactor, you may need days for the reaction to cool down. Right? That's the natural heat loss is not very high. This is one parameter that you should keep in mind. And the last column is the half, uh, you know, half time for cooling and things like that. The second, uh, now the question is exothermic reactions that run without trouble in the lab can blow up when you scale them up to pilot a product. The answer was in the previous slide because often at a small scale, the chemist will not even notice. So we have several cases in the industrial side as well where a chemist will say no problem, the reaction happens very well. Pilot, they have some clues and then at production, the operators can't run the reaction. They say it's too so exothermic that I cannot control the temperature. Why? The same effect. As scale increases, your surface area is not keeping pace. So if you're just doing it in a flask, the heat goes away so fast that you wouldn't detect any problems at all. Specific uh, heat exchange areas. So this is that whole L cube upon L square thing. Uh, the first one is meter cube, then it's meter square, and the last one is the specific area, huh, which is meter square per meter cube. So what that essentially means is per mass or per volume of reactor, how much area is available to cool it? Assuming I'm just using jacket cooling. And you can see that as you go to larger reactors, your specific area came down for orders of magnitude. Starting at 100, it came down to 10 and finally 1. Huh? So the problem exacerbates itself at a larger scale, which is why a lot of these things happen on scale up. Many accident reports, if you read them closely, somebody ran a 1000 liter reactor, no trouble. And then he said, it's running well. I need to make more money. Let's run it at 1200. Then the problem happens. Now, is the conclusion that you never de-bottleneck? No. We need to de-bottleneck because chemical engineering, right? We need to run. But the question is using uh, insights into the engineering and the chemistry, you need to know what changes you need to do when you use extra volume. Do you need to add cooling? Do you need to change the cooling media? What is the largest safe volume at which you can run a particular reaction in a reactor? Right? That is the question that you will have to answer as chemical engineers if you go into the industry. Now, one question. So now, how do you solve this problem? The tyranny of the L square versus L cube. As you go larger, right, you don't have enough area. So every reaction will reach a scale at which you can't pull it through the walls. What do you do? You want to do larger things, right? Reliance has built a huge refinery. You want to do things at scale because there are economies of scale. Remember, large reactors are always cheaper than having 10 smaller reactors. So you want to scale up, but you can't pull it adequately. Now what do you do? Any uh, creative suggestions? How do you cool a batch reactor? Let's talk in the context of an exothermic batch reactor. How do you cool it as it becomes larger? Because you can't keep pace, right? Volume keeps growing, but surface area doesn't grow as fast. Thoughts? Add a, sorry, inert. But that will reduce your productivity, right? You want, why do you want to scale up? Because you want to keep it productive. Both the means I showed you earlier, like an external cooling coil, you know, they are scaling with the size of the reactor, right? Whether you put it inside or outside. Any other thoughts? You're doing a batch exothermic reaction. You can? Cooling jacket, but that's going to again scale with square. Oh, so you're saying you add some uh, fins. 
that will enhance volume but again whatever fins you add they will be on a L square basis. So you could enhance. So suppose you have certain reaction now you have added 20, 30 percent of extra capacity but again as you scale it is going to scale with L square or not with L cube because the fins can't fill the whole volume they can only be on the surface of the vessel but a good idea this is the creative thinking we need. So here is one solution you add a pump and a shell and tube heat exchanger and so what you are doing is I, I didn't draw it all out but you take liquid out from the water and pass it through a pump, pass it through a shell and tube where you cool it up and then send it back to the reactor. Now you have decoupled the problem, the volume remains the volume of the reactor but the surface area you could add as much as you want by increasing the heat transfer area in your shell and tube. And this is one way of doing highly exothermic reactions because you have decoupled. Now you can increase volume independently of heat area. If you need heat transfer area put it here in the exchanger, if you need volume put it in the reactor. Now get it? So now you are not tied to your specific surface area now can be much larger than what a cylinder will allow you. And this is the solution. So highly exothermic reactions think of an external loop with a pump and a heat exchanger. Now that is a bit of a side story. Now we come to a diagram called a Semenov diagram developed originally by a Russian uh, engineer chemist and uh, let me try to interpret this diagram. So on the x axis is temperature, uh, temperature of the reactor or a reaction. It applies to an exothermal reaction with zero order kinetics and right now it is not adiabatic because you are carrying out heat. Let us say you are carrying it out with a jacket. Uh, so U A L M T D applies, U is a heat transfer coefficient, let us keep it constant. Let us imagine the reaction temperature is constant and on the outside you have a constant temperature cooling fluid. Hmm, so that the delta T LM we do not have to worry, essentially it becomes delta T. It is the difference between the internal temperature, it is a well mixed reactor and the external temperature of the cooling fluid. In most cases cooling fluids enter at 30, leave at 40, so it is a good assumption to assume that they are at a constant temperature. Uh, so you do not have to worry about U, you do not have to worry about delta T LM, let us you know A, A is the heat transfer area. So now let us talk about Q, this is the heat removed uh, in watts or whatever units you want. How would Q as a function of reactor temperature look? So we are saying the utility temperature is constant at 30 degrees, heat transfer coefficient in constant, heat transfer area is the surface area that is a constant. The only variable you have is the temperature inside the reactor. As that temperature increases, what happens to Q? If a, if, a, if a reactor became hotter, uh, this can be counterintuitive. If heat transfer coefficient area and cooling fluid are constant temperature, but a reactor becomes hotter, what happens to Q? Increases or reduces? Increases. Uh, so paradoxically, a hotter reactor is easier to cool in some sense. A hotter reactor gives out more heat easily. Hmm? If you want to plot this, so now you want to plot Q versus the reaction temperature. How would that graph look like? exponential, straight line, whatever I have told you right now. Heat removal versus the temperature inside the reactor. It will be a linear which will be a straight line which is this line exactly. What does this line show you? This line shows you that as heat, as the temperature inside a reactor increases, what happens to the heat removal rate? Increases. Huh, clear? Now let us talk about the heat generation rate. As temperature inside a reactor increases, what happens? Exothermic reaction. What happens to the heat generation rate? increases, we already saw that, but does it increase linearly? No, it increases exponentially. That is this exponential curve which we have plotted here. Huh? So now for an operating reaction, where, what temperature will a reaction run at? Suppose I give you a reactor, I give you cooling water, certain heat transfer coefficients and all that and I run a reaction inside it. It is an exothermic reaction, whether it will run at 60 degrees, 80 degrees, 100 degrees depends on where these two curves intersect. The intersection is called a operating point, right? Why? Because at the operating point, heat removal is equal to heat generation. So you will reach a steady state. At any other point, you are at unsteady state. Either generation is higher than removal, so the temperature rises or removal is higher than generation in which case the temperature falls. Hmm? Now I have, to, the question which should come is there are two intersections. Which intersection will the reaction operate at? Because they are very different temperatures. If I take this one, it could be say 60 degrees. This one could be 120 degrees. Will it operate at S or will it operate at I? S, why? Why at S and why not at I? Anyone? Thoughts? 
So S is what we call a stable operating point. Now you must have seen this before in reaction engineering as well. So what happens at a stable operating point? Let's let's give a delta variation. Suppose the temperature is a little lower or a little higher, right? Perturbation. What happens? So suppose the temperature is a little higher, then the removal rate is more than the generation rate. Now come to the right of S, which the li the straight line is above the curve. So the removal rate is more than the generation rate. So the reaction will reactor will cool down. So the temperature will fall back to S. If you are little to the left, temperature is lower. So the reaction rate here, the curve is above the straight line. If you go left, the curve is above. If you go right, the straight line is above. That makes this a stable operating point. So any perturbations will come back to S. Now it's not true. Later, think about I. It doesn't happen. At I, let's let's see. If the, if the temperature is a little higher than I, the generation is much higher than the removal because the curve is above the straight line. So if the temperature for whatever random reason becomes a little higher, the temperature will keep shooting up. And that's a runaway reaction which you do not want. So this is stable and unstable operating points. So this is a Semenow diagram. You can use it to do several things. So for example, if jacket fouling off occurs over time, how do you think the diagram is going to change? Is the curve going to change? No. What would happen with the straight line? U. If fouling happens, U reduces. So if U reduces, the slope of the line will in this case, the slope is not changing, but the lines are moving parallel to themselves. Now, when would that happen? Suppose the temperature of the utility changes. Suppose you are initially working with chilled water, then you are working with cooling water, then you are working with sub tap water. Huh? Then the line will move parallel to itself because in this case, U is not changing. A is also not changing. What is changing is T minus T utility. Right? So, that's the intercept is changing. Now, which brings us to an interesting point at some point, which is this TC critical. After this, you have no intersections at all. So, the reactor at those points will not operate like the heat removal will never, it will never reach steady state. The heat generation will always be higher or, you know, things like that happen. So, there are, so there are certain reactions which you can only run with chilled water or a cryogenic fluid. If you try running them with just cooling water, they will not run because there is no intersection there. And that's more complex. So, let's move ahead. So that's called the critical temperature and it's not related to the thermodynamic critical temperature but the critical temperature is this line which is like the above this there is no solution and a runaway is inevitable. So you have to the cooler the cooling medium you are happy but there comes a limit where any medium not as cool will not be able to sustain this reaction. So this is this is the basics of uh, we'll skip this one this is parametric sensitivity we'll skip that right. Now let's come to another question. So you understood hopefully something so everything so far. So now suppose your reaction is not exothermic, right? So far we looked at exothermic reaction. Suppose your reaction is not exothermic. Now how do I study that? I do it in a calorimeter and it says it's not very exothermic. Am I safe from the explosion point of view? What is your answer? Suppose I have a mildly exothermic reaction. Now am I happy to run it? Or what could be the danger which is lurking? Any thought? That's okay. I'm not worried about. So let's say we are in a explosion, everything is safe and you don't have any spark sources, right? I'm talking about a runaway reaction. Maybe. Any risks? 678 guys, you forget? Anything? Okay, so we'll, we'll come back. Decompositions are usually highly exothermic. What do I mean by that? Suppose take something, take benzene. You can hydrogenate benzene to uh, cyclohexane. It will have some delta H and that's okay. But if the temperature goes high enough, any organic substance, what is going to happen if you take benzene and expose it to 1000 degree temperatures? What do you think happens? CO2 and H2O. At the end, no matter what you start with, everything has to combust and decompose. When the temperature is high enough, any organic, even if you take plastics at high enough temperatures, everything is either a hydrocarbon, right? And or if it's a sulfur, it forms SO2. So it's going to decompose. Most decompositions are difficult, which means they need high activation energies. But when they happen, they are highly exothermic. Uh, heat of reaction is very different from activation energy. Activation energy is this barrier. Heat of reaction is the difference between the initial state and the final state. Uh, so most decompositions are highly exothermic and most reactions. So if you do a A plus B reaction, your heat of reaction may be low. But at some point, it's going to undergo a secondary unwanted decomposition. And that will most likely be highly exothermic. Hmm? You see the impact of this? So suppose you're doing a reaction at 120 degrees, mildly exothermic. You are happy. You say, okay, I'm not going to have a runaway reaction because it's mildly exothermic. But suppose your operator is not paying attention. Suppose there is a cooling loss and the temperature shoots up from 120 to 150 degrees. And there is a secondary decomposition at 150. 
which you are not thinking of at all because that's not what you want to do. It's unwanted. That is usually and in many cases it's highly exothermic. So what you are trying to figure out for runaway reactions is my primary reaction may or may not be okay, but like let's say the primary is okay. How far am I from a dangerous secondary reaction? If you are far away, suppose you are running a reaction at 120 and a decomposition happens at 400, you are happy. Not a very critical reaction. But if you are running at 120 and there is a dangerous exothermic decomposition at 140, you better take a lot of care. And this is not noticed because a lot of people don't know how to find this out. Not very easy, right? How do we know this? How do you know at what point a, reactor, a reaction decomposes? No? Because people don't push temperatures and things like that. And when it happens in plants, then you get an explosion. No? So we, with Strosel, we are again going to see what happens there. Which comes up to the question, how do we find out uh, if a secondary decomposition is going to happen? And if it happens, is it exothermic enough that you have to worry about it? No? Every reaction is different. How you do that is through a bunch of experimental or analytical equipment. This is called a differential scanning calorimeter. It, there are also things like RCs and ARCs, reaction calorimetry, accelerating rate calorimetry. So these are all devices which have been invented. It's a whole science in itself. Today we'll just look at what's called a DSC, hmm? differential scanning calorimeter. So what is a DSC? You take a small sample, you start heating it up. Hmm? You take a small sample, unfortunately I didn't show you a photo, but I mean, it looks like this. Inside it is a crucible, which is made of some metal. You put a very small quantity, half a gram, a milligram in it, and it has a lot of accurate equipment. And now you start heating it up. You specify the rate, one degree per minute, four degrees per minute. What the equipment monitors is at every temperature, is there heat liberation or heat uh, absorption? And what is the rate at which it happens? And the graph you get is something like this. On the x-axis is temperature, which is an independent variable. You are controlling the temperature now. You have specified a scan rate of 4 degrees per minute, which means the temperature, if you start it at 0 degrees, it slowly, every minute the temperature will go up by 4 degrees till it reaches 300 degrees. What you are monitoring on the y-axis is how much heat is liberated in say watts or kilowatts or milliwatts or something like that. Hmm? Now, let's interpret this. This is a reaction A plus B. You made a mixture, mixture and normally say the reaction would happen at 100 degrees. But you made a mixture and you put it inside a DSC. You will get a graph. It's a very safe way of doing it because a lot of reactions, if they're exploding, if you may want them to explode at one milligram, nothing happens. Uh, but if you did it in a lab flask and you heated it up, at some point, if it's going to have a runaway, your flask will explode. Uh, so you don't want that, which is why the DSC was invented. Now, what happens? The, the Above this line, whatever is above, the peaks are exotherms and the peaks below are endotherms. So forget what happens, this is a peak we don't focus on. This peak, which says 300 kilojoules per kilogram, the area under the peak, that is typically the heat of the reaction. So this is the primary peak, which means at somewhere around 100 degrees, A plus B reacts, it's exothermic and the heat liberated is 300 kilojoules per kilogram. Hmm? This is the heat of reaction. This is what you would see in a normal reaction if you conduct this reaction, A plus B. A plus B gives some product, you are happy, 300 kilojoule is liberated, you remove it, problem is stopped. However, if you continue heating it at a higher temperature, say 200 degrees Celsius, what is going to happen? There is more heat liberation here, which is a decomposition peak, which you would normally never see because you don't reach those temperatures. But each reaction will have a peak like that at some temperature, usually. If you run a DSC, now you know how far away are you from that peak. You know that. And that is the reason to run a DSC and we'll see how we incorporate it into our analysis. Another question, delta T adiabatic. Now what is that? Heat liberated divided by the specific heat of a mixture. A CP you know very easily. Normally for a reaction, you don't know delta HR. How do you find that out? Run a DSC. The area under the peak, it is delta HR divided by CP. And now you know what the adiabatic rise is. So if the peak is large, delta T AD is high, you know you are dealing with a dangerous reaction. Now clear? This is the utility of a DSC. Now unwanted, the, in this table all you want to see is for typical reactions, the desired reaction may have a specific energy of 100 kilojoules, the decomposition can have 2000 kilojoules, uh, 20 times. The adiabatic temperature rise of primary may be 50, the secondary may be 1000. Uh, this is how different the primary reaction and the secondary can be sometimes. Uh, so I'm just pointing out that this is not a small difference and that's where all the uh, thermal explosion problems come from. Hmm? This slide, uh, if you remember and if you now, everything else we've done so far is to come to this slide and the next few slides. 
what are the critical questions to ask regarding an exothermic batch reaction? And if you know it for a batch, you can then do it for continuous. Usually continuous is safer because smaller volumes are involved. Right, so what are the questions? The y-axis is temperature. X-axis is a progress of a reaction. Think of it as time or some other variable like that. First question, can the process temperature be controlled by the cooling system? Um, this is about normal operations, not unusual, not abnormal. Un normal operations, can the process temperature be controlled by the cooling system you have? The cooling system could be coils, limpets, jackets, external heat exchanger, whatever you have. How do you answer this question? Seminar diagram, uh, UA LMTD. At steady state, can you carry out, can you carry away enough heat so that the temperature remains constant? Constant or whatever program, you don't want it to keep increasing. You want to control the temperature. This is this part of the process, the normal process. Now, often temperature will rise in a normal process, remember, because you're not carrying it out adiabatically, but neither are you carrying out isothermally. You get a little bit of a rise. So you start a temperature at 80 degrees, but you allow it to increase to 150 degrees. This is the normal part. Now, first question. Second question, what temperature can be attained after the after a runaway of the desired? If there is a runaway, what temperature will be attained? Now, you guys answer the second question. Which parameter al allows you to answer question two? What temperature is attained after runaway of the desired reaction? We just spoke about it. Hmm? Delta T AD, right? Because I, adiabatic is the worst case. Uh, so this is in a way 2 is answering what is the maximum temperature. In the real case, there may be some heat loss, you may cool it. Suppose all your heating, all your cooling fails, all your agitation fails, the reactor behaves absolutely adiabatically. What is the maximum temperature it can reach? Uh, delta H reaction divided by the specific heat. This is your 2. Uh, correlate the text points with what I am showing you on the diagram. The TP is the normal operating temperature. If everything converts, all the exotherm is absorbed by the reaction, no cooling happens, you will reach this point which is called MTSR, we'll look at what MTSR is and that is point number 2. How do you find out delta T AD? Through a differential scanning calorimetry, if you have not done that, you would estimate it and through simulations, through Aspen, you will find out what is the heat of reaction divided by specific heat, you can estimate what T is. The higher this is, the more dangerous your reaction. Huh? What uh, now? 3 is a very similar question to 2. The only difference between 2 and 3 is 2 is talking about the desired reaction, 3 is talking about the secondary reaction. So the parameter remains the same, delta T AD, but 3 is about the second peak. So what I am saying is there are two peaks here, right? Uh, the desired peak will give you the first delta T AD, the undesired peak, remember the values are different, right? So you can get very different numbers. In this case, see, uh, in this table, the first peak may be only 50 Kelvin, but the second one can be 1000 Kelvin, right? It will depend on every reaction, but unless you have done a DSC or analysis, you don't know the height of this peak. Uh, so that is the third question. So far, uh, all the questions we did were thermodynamic. We'll skip 4. 4 is a little bit of a difficult question, which just says that this point, right, 4, in every reaction, there comes a point of maximum accumulation. At the initial, you have all the reagents, then they start getting consumed. So at some point, these are typically semi-batch reactions. So you're dosing something, huh? you're not adding things all at once. So there is a point of maximum consequence. So if a failure happens at that point, the worst case scenario will happen. So that is number four, but a little difficult. So we'll, we'll ignore that. Let's talk about number five. How fast is the runaway? So, so far we only looked at thermo. We didn't look at kinetics. But how fast is this um, five? This gap, this could be small or large. And remember, these are independent parameters. You can have the same delta T adiabatic in a very short period, which is nasty, which is explosions. All of TNT, all of RDX is very fast reactions with a lot of release. But you could have the same amount of release over a long period of time. It wouldn't be so bad, right? So the time matters and we have not looked at how to calculate it. But so the smaller this time interval, the lesser time the operator has to react. Hmm? And so that is five. And similarly, how fast is the runaway? So that is 6. These are parameters that you need to know. And Stossel was the first guy who sort of put this on a proper framework. Hmm? Now, how do we look at uh, identifying severity? So if you wanted to just apply this, whatever I'm talking about today, right? Not as engineers, but as a chemist, you don't want all the basics. Look at this table. If your delta T adiabatic is very high, 400 degrees, you have a very, very severe runaway risk. 
If it's between 200 to 400, not so bad. If it's less than 50, your risk is very low. So if there was only one thing that every industry in India did in specialty chemicals or whatever, take your reaction mixture, put it on a DSC, find out your delta T adiabatic. If you come with a large number, start worrying about it. If you come with a small number, in general, you don't have a problem or you, you, you know, your priority is lower. This is heuristics for identifying the severity of a runaway, not the probability, but the severity. Uh, as usual, the insurance guys are the pioneers in a lot of this. This is called the Zurich hazard analysis because, of course, if your reactor explodes, they used to have to pay the money and hence they developed a lot of these frameworks. Uh, what about the second question? If you have the same Q, will it lead to the same delta T AD? No, because it depends on your CP, right? If you have a higher dilution, the same reaction, but once you do it in uh, 1 is to 3 methanol, once you do it in 1 is to 5 methanol. The more the dilution, the more the specific heat available, right? CP of methanol doesn't say change, but it's MCP. So that MCP changes and so for the same heat evolved, if you run a dilute reaction, you may not have as high a delta T AD. Remember for delta T AD, you are running the actual reaction mixture. So you are running A plus B plus solvent, put it inside the calorimeter and see what answer it gives you, right? So if you have a very dangerous one, one way to make it less dangerous is run it in a dilute. Questions? Okay. Now, these are Stossel's criticality classes. There are five criticality classes from one through five. The risk increases as you go. Five means usually very hazardous. You will try to avoid a five if at all possible. One can still explode. The one doesn't mean nothing bad will happen, but it's relatively a low risk criteria. Now, we'll look at the next, this and the next slide. So, let's, let, it's a little complex and, you know, I confuse myself. So, so let's look at PP. What is PP? This is the normal process temperature. We are talking about a batch reaction. The normal temperature at which you are running it is called TP. So all five classes, this is the baseline. We are, we are talking about the same reaction. The classes depend on how you are going to carry it. Let's look at the second part which is called MTSR. Remember you saw the MTSR on the previous slide as well. This is MTSR. So it's fairly obvious to you what is MTSR? PP plus delta T. So normal reaction, if it went under adiabatic conditions, what is the maximum temperature reached? Unfortunately, they gave them very weird names, MTSR, maximum temperature of the synthesis reaction, whatever. But this is MTSR, PP plus delta T AD, ignore the XAC, we'll just assume that XAC is 1. In some reactions, right, if you are confident that the accumulation can never be more than 10%, then you could take the XAC as 0.1 and take some credit for that. Right? We are not looking at that. Let's take XAC as 1, full accumulation. So, PP plus delta T AD is MTSR. The MTSR is shown by this hatch line here. Right? So, for each one, the MTSR is now shown different because these are different classes that we are going to be looking at. Third point, MTT, maximum temperature for technical reasons. A reaction can be carried out in two ways. Now, suppose it's carried out, let's talk about a pressure reaction. What is MTT? The Ah, now, for a pressure reaction, you will have either a rupture disc or a PRV. Ah, they will have a set pressure. So, suppose you are doing a reaction at uh, 2 bar pressure. What would be a rupture disc pressure? Lower than 2 bar or higher than 2 bar? Higher than 2 bar. Now, at that pressure, there is a corresponding temperature. How do you find it out? By using whatever solvent you have. Suppose you are doing a reaction in methanol at 2 bars. Whatever is the temperature from the Antoine equation is the corresponding MTT. What means is if you heat the solvent and the PRV relieves or the RD explodes, at that point, what would be the temperature inside the reaction? That is MTT. Is that clear? See, suppose I just fill a reactor with uh, water and I start heating up the reactor. It's a pressure vessel and I've already attached a pressure relief valve which is supposed to open at 5 bar. Uh, will it open at 100 degrees? No, the pressure is low enough. It's 1 bar, it won't, or 2 bars case, it won't explode. You keep going up, at some point the temperature is high enough that 5 bar is reached, at that point the PRV will open. That temperature is the MTT. So MTT is basically the temperature which corresponds to your technical device. So what's your technical device? Either a PRV or a rupture disc. Huh? Now the question is, what if the reaction is uh, atmospheric then? Suppose I have an atmospheric reactor. I am doing a reactor in an open vessel. Now, what would the MTT be? Because you don't have a PRV or a RD. So, huh? Good guess. But suppose I am doing it in a solvent, right? So, I could do a certain reaction, atmospheric conditions, in either methanol, in ethanol, or a high boiling solvent like what a cyclopentadiene. 
would the MTT remain the same? I mean, one bar is a pressure. So one thing will be, how do you convert the pressure to a temperature? What would your MTT? You are close, but how do you do that? So one bar is the pressure, but MTT is temperature. So how do you do it for an atmospheric pressure? What, what equation relation allows you to relate pressures to temperatures? Antoine equation. So what you would do, the only difference is it's one bar means a different temperature depending on what solvent you have. One bar with methanol could give you 64, with ethanol could give you 90, with a high boiling solvent could give you 120, right? So depending on the solvent's Antoine, you will calculate a MTT. Hmm? Uh, what would you do if it's a cryogenic? Forget that. But uh, so these are the first three parameters. Last one is TDC, decomposition temperature. Now, there are ways of finding it out. For now, let's just assume, it's a bad assumption, I'll, we can discuss that, but let's just assume that T decomposition is this temperature. At whatever you see the peak, the large peak of decomposition, that is your onset temperature. Now, it's not a good assumption, there are other ways to do it, but for now. So, T decomposition is, if I take it to this temperature, things will start decomposing. I'll get my secondary, which is highly exothermic. I know it's heavy, but you know, try to try to focus for us. So you understood? So far you understood, I hope. Um, so the next slide is the same one, but it's just a little larger. So, so these are the same five classes. Now let's look at each class. Let's look at class number one. So you're just focusing on this part, the left part. <coughs> this is your operating temperature. If for whatever reason your cooling and agitation both failed, the reactor will behave adiabatically. What temperature would be reached? This is an exothermic uh, uh, MTSR, right? Because MTSR, what did I see in the last slide? MTSR is um, TP plus delta T adiabatic. So even if no cooling is there, you cannot exceed the MTSR. You start from here, you will go to the MTSR. Hmm? Nothing happens. At this temperature, even your pressure relief valve will not open. That's fine because your reactor is rated, like the PRV is strong enough to take the maximum temperature. And decomposition is even higher. TD24 is your decomposition temperature. So it won't decompose. The PRV won't open. It's an extremely safe reaction. Remember, if you do any SLP project, you can apply this already. You don't need anything else. So long as you have a DSC or a way to estimate it, you can apply this to any reaction and estimate, am I in class 1? If you are in class 1, you are usually safe. You don't have a problem. Before we go to the intermediate classes, let's go to class 5, the riskiest class. Here what is happening? If you have a cooling failure or agitation, your MTSR is this. Huh? So your temperature rises from whatever this point was to this point. You have already crossed the TD24, which means your decomposition has set in. Which means your original T adiabatic doesn't even apply anymore. The decomposition is highly adiabatic. So it will shoot up way beyond that. Because not only is the primary reaction happening, the decomposition already started. Right? The most dangerous class of reaction. And the MTT is not yet reached. So it's not even going to relieve. Which means, if the MTT had been reached, your substances would have been sent to a flare or a stack or a dump or something like that. In class 5 reactions, if things go wrong, temperature increases to a point where a secondary decomposition sets up, nasty substances may be produced, highly exothermic reactions may happen, and it's all happening inside the reactor, at which point the reactor may still explode. Very dangerous. So your goal should be to avoid class 5 reactions, and if you encounter them, try to move to lower classes. Let's look at class 3. Let's look at what happens here. Sorry. Yeah. MTT is controlled bias. Absolutely. Which is what you want to do. So if you discover, but how would you know that unless you knew Stossel's classes? If you just ran a reaction like a chemist does and you have not been taught this, you don't even know what your MTT is. Now you are talking. Right? It's very easy to remove MTT. So like if you want to change MTSR class 5 to a 4, you would reduce the MTT. Now let's, let's do that. Now we come from class 5 to a class 4 reaction. And let's look at a class 4, what happens. So in a class 4, even before it reaches decomposition, it will relieve. Hopefully you will be safe. I'm saying hopefully because now a couple of considerations become important. What happens when you relieve? Is it going to lead to a Bhopal-like scenario? So your reactor may not explode, but people will still die. You don't want that. So for a class 4, you have to worry about what do I do to the gases which get released. Second, is my relief device large enough? You have to worry about it in class 4 because if it's not large enough, it will open but it will not relieve everything and the pressure will still rise and it will explode. Right? But bringing 5 to 4 is exactly what you said. If you, you derate your MTT and uh, make a reaction happen in that, uh, in that sense. But it's not that easy because 
as you derate your pressure, your relief area changes. So you may have to change the device itself. And there are other considerations, but your thought process is correct. Point is, you will not even think of this unless you know what class the reaction belongs to. So this is a very important diagram for that. Hmm? Now let's come to class 4 or 5 we saw. Let's come to class 3 for example. Or uh, yeah, let's look at class 3. This is a good class because the device will relieve. But even if it didn't, suppose you had some problem, it should come to a temperature where the decomposition has not set in. In class 4 and 5, the decomposition has set in. Now the question you can ask me is, why will the decomposition ever set in if it's already relieved? It will set in if the relief area is not sufficient and hence it's relieving but it's still going into decomposition. In class 3 is even safer because even if it doesn't relieve fully, it can't go to the decomposition zone because your maximum adiabatic temperature is below that. Hmm? So this is how you look at all the Stossel classes and try to move a reaction towards a lower class, right? Question? No. We saw this. That's a flare, right? So it's not that you can just say that, oh, I have a class 2 reaction, I'll be safe. Your flare has to be working. You have to figure out what happens. See, we are preventing an explosion. But there have been some examples of recent accidents where the explosion was prevented, but a lot of people died by inhaling the gases, right? So it's not sufficient to just prevent. It's the primary purpose though. What people don't realize is sometimes 10 guys die in a release, which is bad. But if an explosion had happened, maybe 2000 guys would have died. Explosions are enormous. Like the first task is to prevent an explosion. A fire or a release bad, but you hopefully have other ways to deal with that. Hmm? What are alternative design ideas? Suppose you get trapped in class 5. One is what you said. What else could you do? Suppose you are in a class 5 reaction and you don't want to make it safer. What else could you do? And now you have uh, uh, moved a little. Most reactions are not batch. You never dump two things and start a reaction. These are semi-batch. So you take one liquid in a reaction and slowly start dosing the other one. Most reactions are of this nature. What else could you do? Any ideas? Some, some thoughts. Reduce the concentration. Right? If you reduce the concentration, your delta H changes, your CP increases, no problem. Change from batch to semi-batch. Increase the dosing time. Hmm? Optimize your conditions in order to minimize accumulation. We didn't look at accumulation. Sometimes reverse addition order. So instead of putting A into B, you may put B into A. Huh? That can change scenarios. Or change to continuous operation. A hmm? lot of things you can do, but only if you are aware first that you are in class 5. If you are not aware, you just continue running it. Finally, an accident happens and then Professor Roy has to go and investigate what went wrong. Now that is, that's not what we want to do. So this is, this is why you need to awareness for what went wrong. So far, we looked at severity. I know I'm packing a lot in one class, apologies. But uh, we'll also look at probabilities. Huh? Severity and probability is different. Severity is how bad are things when things happen. So probability is based on this concept called TMR, time. But this is a time concept. So this is related to kinetics. So far, we only looked at thermodynamics. So what this says is, if a reaction, uh, what this means is how, what is the x-axis? See, this x-axis distance, 5 and 6, are they short or are they long? Do you want 5 and, let's talk about 5. Do you want 5 to be short or long? Which is safer, short 5 or long 5? Huh? Long 5, it gives you more time to react. What is safer, short 6 or long 6? Long 6 gives you more, more time to react. This is kinetics. It's not thermo. So kinetics is always harder to find than thermo. So there are ways to do it. We won't go into the detail, but all I'll tell you is there is a parameter called TMR AD. TMR means time to maximum rise. How fast does the adiabatic rise happen? If it happens in less than one hour, you better be uh, worried. If it happens in more than 100 hours, then the operator has a lot of time to do other things, right? Cool it down, dump it, add a retarder, things like that. So this is the probability. Huh? Remember, these are independent actions, um, uh, severity and probability. Um, to illustrate this, take two cases, huh? case one and case two. The final temperatures may be the same on the y-axis. Which one is more dangerous? One or two? Case 1. Happens very fast, you can't react to it. That is what the probability thing is measuring. You put it all together, you get a matrix like this. Uh, you get a severity here, which is based on delta T AD. You get a probability here, which is based on TMR AD. If, uh, if TMR is small and delta T is high, you have this. This quadrant is the most dangerous one, where high adiabatic rise, but going to happen very fast. And these are very numerical parameters. So what I'm saying is there's not very concept, like this is not just uh, waving, hand waving. You all, all you need is two parameters. If I were to go to all the plants in India, just check delta T AD and the probability number, 
you at least have a fair idea which are the plants you have to watch for or within a plant if you want to see which are my reactions which are the most dangerous ones for an explosion this is the table you need and they're not very difficult run a dsc a dsc run takes one hour two hours maybe five thousand rupees if it explodes it's going to cost you crores of rupees so i think there's an awareness gap you know the structural reasons we discussed last time about why this doesn't happen there is a case study have a look at it uh, you know i just i'll just keep it there and this is very close to the Seveso explosion that happened, right? Somebody stores the system and uh, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. So there was, there's a weekend always. People want to go home. Uh, a reaction is complete. They kept it in a vessel at 90 degrees. They knew that there was an exothermic decomposition, but they estimated it. It was 1% per day. So the weekend is two days. They estimated it. If it happens, only 3% decomposes. They did a calculation. They thought the increase would be 12 degrees, which was okay. What they did not factor in was the self-accelerating behavior. See, what was estimated as 1% per day was estimated at, say, 90 degrees. But the moment it becomes 95, it's not decomposing at 1%. Maybe it's decomposing at 10. And because of that, now temperature rises even faster. And then when you go to the higher one, it may decompose at 20% a day. And pretty soon, you're not talking about a rise of 12 degrees, but a rise of, say, 100 degrees. And the whole thing explodes. And in this case, I think nobody died because of the explosion because it was a weekend. But a lot of toxics were released into the rivers and things like that, right? So you have to, yeah, sorry, PCBs. So a lot of them are similar. So this is a case study. But if you see the if you see the evolutions of that, a lot of them are similar. The ones which happened in Seveso, Italy, other places. Another different question. Now, so far we always said batch exothermic, adiabatic exothermic. What if the reaction is not exothermic, both primary and secondary? Both peaks are small. Do I need to worry? Oh, no worries. Well, how would it explode? There's no... There's no self-accelerating reaction. Can a reactor, do you have to worry about an explosion only? Even for non-exothermic, they're very corner cases, but you need to be aware of them. What could happen? How could a reactor explode? Go back to basics. Pressure vessel, not an exothermic primary, not an exothermic secondary. Can it still explode? If it's releasing gases. That's the answer. And that's what you have to be thinking about. So if a reaction has gas liberation, right, and I'll give you an example, I mean, azides are a good example, but take the, in a car you have an airbag, right, that inflates very fast, you know how it does it, so there is a sodium azide inside, so this is a solid, remember liquids and gases, volume increases, solid gases, same thing, it increases even more than a liquid gas transition, so you have a solid here, very low volume, the moment it decomposes, Na is a solid, don't worry, N2, gas. So from very small gram amounts of solid, you will have like half a room filled of gas, N2. Again, the sodium combines with, they also, in addition to NaN3, they also pack KNO3 in there. The sodium combines with KNO3, K2O solid, Na2O solid, you get N2, more N2. So in a very fast reaction, if you liberate a large amount of gas, you are going to have an explosion. Right, so nobody is going to do this inside a reactor, but you have to figure out based on your functional groups. I didn't have that slide, unfortunately, but a lot of functional groups, if you have nitrogens, azides, azo bonds, think what are, if there is a gas liberation going to happen. And now remember that DSC will not allow you to track gas liberation because the DSC is only looking at temperature releases, which is why you have things like an ARC or a RC. In an ARC, it's very similar to a DSC, but it's a little larger and it's a closed vessel and they put a pressure probe in there. So even if you have a reaction where there is no exothermicity, but a lot of gas is liberated, you are tracking, I should have shown you the graph, you are tracking the pressure inside the reactor. So even if it's a cool reaction, the temperature will not go up, but the pressure will go up, which is a warning sign for you. So a lot of reactions, if you have CO2 liberation, N2 liberation, hydrogen peroxide decomposes, O2 liberation, you may or may not have an exotherm. Sometimes you'll still have an exotherm, but any place where you have a gas liberation possible, your reactor may still explode because of that. Right? So you have to be worried in addition to whatever we saw, just make sure that there's no gas liberation. Right? And one thing, sometimes the primary doesn't liberate a gas, but the secondary may liberate a gas. Right? And so there are experimental ways of dealing with it. But if you still look at the chemistry, if you see an azo bond, be very worried because you know that the nitrogen is going to happen because of it. Uh, so this is gas liberation. Classic explosives. Most explosives, if you go and see the structure, you'll see a lot of nitrogens in there. Why? Because once it decomposes, what happens to the nitrogen? Gas. Right? And so most we call entropic explosions and things like that. So that is on the uh, explosive side. Uh, we saw the case study, so we'll, you can have a look at it later. Uh, probably one of the last points, but it's important. If I have a reactor, which is a pressure vessel, and I have a PRV RDM, I always say, 
sometimes the pressure vessel is like, uh, how do I say, you know, if you are in a bus, you have a photo of a god there, right? It's there. So when a pressure vessel is there, a lot of operators say, oh, pressure vessel, I checked it last month, now I'm happy. Should you be? What else can go wrong? One? Sorry? Okay, so let's say it's non-toxic. Huh? This is like a case study. Let's say it's a non-toxic release. Do I have to worry about an explosion with a pressure vessel which has a PRV on it? Could get overwhelmed. In what way? How do you overwhelm a? Sorry? And when you say proper rating, what are the rating parameters for a PRV? Uh, like so for a tank, it's volume. So if you go to a shop and you want to buy a PRV, uh, so if you want to buy a pump, you may say pressure rating and flow rate. For a PRV, what are the two parameters? Release pressure and area. So for a lot of cases, release pressure is relatively easy to calculate, right? You know the if your reactor is rated for 10 bar, you can't have the PRV about 10 bar. It has to be below. So somewhere between your design temperature and your reactor's MAWP, maximum allowable pressure. That's okay. The area is the tricky part. How do you decide the area of a PRV? Suppose I give you a reaction, how would you decide it? And now we have time, now, now most of the, uh, let's open it up to a challenging topic. Like if you're the first guy who has to decide this, how do you decide? Do I need a one inch, six inch? How large a PRV do I need? And then? Okay, great. So. So you are absolutely right, but now just as a devil's advocate, I will put a question. Suppose the rate comes out to 100 kilos per second. How do you decide 100 kilos can go out through a 1 inch orifice and through a 10 inch orifice? What is the limiting parameter? Like why not? Suppose it's, the rate comes to 100 uh, kgs per second and I have only provided a 1 inch PRV. Why would that not be sufficient? It will just go rather fast, right? What is the parameter which drives this? Are you understanding my question? What is the relation between, like say we said pressure, temperature, and time? What is the relation between the orifice size and the relief rate? So let me put the question the other way. For a certain orifice, suppose I have an orifice which is of this pipe is one meter one inch diameter. Does this have a natural maximum flow rate which can flow this through this pipe? And what is that flow rate? What is it? See, in general, as velocity increases, see, velocity multiplied by cross-sectional area is flow rate. But would this pipe reach a maximum flow rate? And what would that be? This is a fundamental fluid flow question. Through this pipe, what is the maximum flow of gas or vapor? Most of these reliefs are vapors, right? You're not worrying about liquids so much. For a gas through a pipe of a certain orifice, what is the maximum flow rate? So that's the choking velocity, right? So that's the choking velocity, which means that at some point, there is a supersonic, so we won't again go back to your fluid flow, but the point is, see, this is the ratio on the x-axis, but y-axis is the flow rate. At a certain point, doesn't matter what the delta P across an orifice is, the flow rate becomes a constant rate. And which is why most PRVs or RDs, when they relieve, remember in the video they said it made the sound like a jet engine when it relieved? Why is that sound? Because it's going at sonic velocity, roughly. Going at very high velocity, no more. Even if the delta P increases inside the vessel, no more comes out at that rate. And normally, as the delta P over an orifice increases, the flow rate will increase. But if you have reached choked flow, it will not increase beyond that. And most of these devices operate at choked flow. So again, coming back to the question, just having a PRV, just having the set pressure correct is not enough. The size should be sufficient. In a similar way, an atmospheric reactor is not always safe. A lot of cases, the vent is there, but it may not be able to relieve the gases which are released in a runaway. The volumes are so large that the vent, the role of the vent is to just loading, unloading, keep the pressure equal. But it may not relieve for a runaway. The vent sizes are too large. How do you deal with that? This is like the bonus question. Suppose you have a large tank. You see these petroleum tanks, etc. Very large. They have a vent for equalization. As you fill petrol or remove, the vent will keep it atmospheric. Uh, those are not pressure vessels. It would be too expensive. But suppose the vent is not sufficient. Suppose you calculate if there's a fire or a runaway, the gases are going to be so much that the vent is not sufficient. What is your last line of defense on a tank? Uh, you've probably not done equipment design or maybe. So there is something called in the API, American Petroleum Institute code, there's something called a frangible roof weld. Frangible roof weld. What that means is in when you design a tank, the whole tank is designed strongly, the weld at the roof has to be the weakest weld possible. 
so that if the relief is not there, that weld is going to fracture and then of course the tank is lost, but at least you didn't have an explosion, right? So a lot of these things have been thought by people and they encounter the design code. So one thing is to look up a design code. So if you see a design code, uh, then you see a lot of uh, the thoughts, uh, thought process for that. So this is the reference. It's a big book, probably like 400 pages. So you know you don't need to do it for the exam or the quiz. Whatever I've taught today will be on the quiz and the exam. But if somebody wants to know more about it, it's a fascinating uh, book out there. Yeah, uh, questions? For pressure relief valves, there are a lot of factors. I don't want to go into the details because it's not possible. It's called the Deers methodology. And there are a lot of, if you look at the textbook by Crowell, it will have some of the stuff in it. So there's a whole science behind uh, how you set the pressure. The area varies depending on set pressure. So what you're talking about, sometimes if you reduce the area, the pressure reduces. So the density reduces. So you need a larger valve, right? So all those factors are there. So it's a quite a complex science, but this is, this is the principle behind it. The details, you look at a code and you'll be able to figure it out. We could do, we could do pressure relief valve design in itself is a science. How you choose a RD when you choose a PRV, right? And so if you're, if somebody is going to take 678 this year, we probably do this part over four lectures. So I'm trying to cram a lot of it in one lecture. So apologies if it was too fast. Yeah, but if you have questions, ask me, we can have office hours, huh? we'll, we'll look at that. We just wanted to expose you to this because you don't want to go into the industry without ever having, and a lot of people do, but I think if you, if you are knowledgeable about it, uh, we'll have a safer uh, Indian chemical. Yeah, thanks. So if you have any questions, ask me, I'm around. We'll stop the record.